Welcome to this SED session on the nature of firms and macroeconomic implications. My name is Yue Ma from the University of Chicago. This session has four papers in the order listed here. Each presentation will have 25 minutes and we will have Q&A Q together at the end. Five minutes before the end of each presentation, you will hear a notification from me like the following. And then I will provide another notification when the time is up. Participants can ask questions via the Q&A box anytime, which the authors can address anytime in writing, or you can use the raise the hand function during the Q&A section. As we convene here today, it is inevitable to be reminded of the loss of Emmanuel Farhi, who was scheduled to present here today. In addition, his work with David has deeply influenced the theme of this session and the work presented here. It is one of the many reflections of the wide range of work that he inspired. A more comprehensive summary of his contributions was presented in the tribute session by the AEA and the SED earlier today, and you can watch the recording online. Emmanuel once described the line of work with David as trying to uncover the fundamental laws of economics, like their fundamental laws of physics. I'm glad that we can hear a part of it from David today. I hope that the many important ideas and insights from his work, which he had dedicated his passion to, will live on. And now the SED program chair, Eric Cristiano, will say a few words. Larry, you're still on mute. There we go. Um, on behalf of the Society for Economic Dynamics, I want to thank you, Yaron, for putting together this great program. Um, Emmanuel Fari, together with, with David, is on the program. And it's a somber and sad fact that Emmanuel has passed away and can't be here. He gave a lot to the economics profession, and he had a lot more uh, still to give. And I don't just mean intellectually, but also he contributed a lot to colleagues, students, and friends by his humanity. Um, as Yaron said, we were, we were reminded of this at the joint AEA SED memorial session for Emmanuel this morning. And in case you missed it, um, registered participants in these meetings can watch the session on the ASSA's virtual platform. It's the same thing that you use to get into this session. Um, and part of, as part of that session, Yaron and a committee of five others presented a video montage of uh, statements by colleagues, uh, students, and friends talking about Emmanuel's brilliant mind, and they also talked about him as a person. Uh, the video montage is part of the session, uh, so you can see it as a registered uh, participant here, but it's also publicly available on a YouTube channel as well as on the SED website. And Manuel had a close connection to the Society of Economic Dynamics. His general approach to economics was very similar to the approach of the membership of the SED. In particular, what animated his research is the, the big questions of our time, and he was especially interested in tackling the conceptual issues that those questions raise. He was a frequent and honored visit to Minneapolis, and he gave an inspiring SED plenary lecture a few years ago. He will be sorely missed. Thank you very much, Larry. And with that, we will start the presentations with David. The first paper is Entry versus Rents. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for uh, putting this paper on the program, and thanks a lot for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this paper on Emmanuel's behalf. Um, obviously, um, the loss of Emmanuel hit everybody very hard, and I think people who are close to him, uh, a lot of us, we still haven't really accepted it. It's been a very difficult reality to try to come to terms with. Um, so this paper um, is called Entry versus Rents. Uh, 
And one way to summarize what, what it is that Emmanuel and I were trying to do in this paper is to think of it as a theory of aggregation when you have powerful scale economies um, in the environment. So we have always been interested sort of in this research agenda that we had together, we were interested in trying to understand how we should aggregate shocks. If you have a disaggregated economy with lots of complexities, how can you think about going from the micro shocks to the aggregate objects? What are the sufficient statistics that are gonna determine that? Um, and what it is that you have to pay attention to? Now, before telling you what it is that we do in this paper, I think that it's useful to set the scene by talking about the sort of the classic results, uh, the classic answers to this question. Uh, and by that, I refer to this result known as Halton's theorem, which is a very powerful result that sort of pervades neoclassical economics. Um, it basically says that if you have an arrow de Roux kind of environment, then the elasticity of real GDP in that economy with respect to a productivity shock to some disaggregated producer let's call it K, is just given by the sales of that producer as a share of GDP. And that's really all you need to know. Uh, and so these sales shares, which are sometimes called domar weights, are approximate sufficient statistics for what's going on under the hood, as it were. Now, this result is tremendously useful, uh, but it's really the, the proof is for economies where there are no meaningful returns to scale and there's no meaningful margin by which you can think about the entry and exit of firms or the entry and exit of products. And so one way to frame this paper is we're trying to take this kind of logic into economies where you have a meaningful notion of entry and exit. The general result that we're able to show is that changes in real GDP in environments with entry are in general gonna depend on not just sales shares, but also changes in rents and changes in quasi rents. And it's these changes in rents and quasi rents that are the sufficient statistics for summarizing the details of what's going on under the hood. Now we provide formulas for what these changes in rents and quasi rents are in terms of the microeconomic primitives in general. Those are gonna depend on things like elasticities of substitution, the detail of the production network and the scale elasticities. And then these results can be used to answer questions like what are the losses from inefficiencies to society? What would be the gains from optimal policy? What does second best policy look like? What does first best policy look like? Things of that nature. Quantitatively, we find that this entry margin is very powerful. Um, so at the micro level, it really changes the way the model behaves in terms of how a shock to I is gonna affect producer J. But it's also powerful at an from an aggregate perspective. So for example, a question like, what are the losses from, um, what are the inefficiency losses from the existence of firm level markups? The answers are doubled if you build in an entry margin into your model. So getting a grip on these things, I think quantitatively is very important. So the general goal is gonna be a theory of aggregation with entry. Uh, we're gonna have a fairly rich structure so that we sort of, uh, we, we try to encompass as many forces as are possible. So we're gonna have arbitrary input output linkages between producers uh, in our economy with arbitrary production functions, uh, elasticities of substitution, and also an abstract way of modeling entry that captures lots of different kinds of models. The model is gonna feature Ricardian rents, uh, which is to say rents that come from diminishing returns to scale. And it's gonna feature monopoly rents that come from the existence of market power or markups. And so we can have increasing or decreasing internal or external returns to scale. And then what we do for this model is we provide comparative statics with respect to productivity shocks and with respect to wedges. And then using these, we build first and second best policies and look at what the associated gains are. So I'll start just by setting up the model, then I'll focus on a particularly important benchmark, which is the marginal cost pricing benchmark. Then we'll talk about the inefficient models in general, and then I'll quickly summarize what the policy implications are. So the model has kind of three kinds of agents. There's producers and entrants on the production side, and then there's a representative household. And the household is very easy. So all the action is on the production side of the economy. You have a bunch of entrants and these potential entrants are indexed by their type, J. And these entrants, they have the option to pay an entry cost. And if they pay their entry cost, then they draw some technology 
and they draw some markup according to some underlying distribution. So this distribution, we're gonna call it zeta. Okay, now the way to think about this is this is like an abstract way of handling different kinds of entry conditions. So if you're thinking about like a multi-sector model with entry, you want this zeta to basically be something that looks like a diagonal matrix. Because if I wanna open a restaurant, I open a restaurant. If I pay the entry cost for opening a restaurant, I don't accidentally end up with a manufacturing plant. So in this case, this zeta ends up being like a diagonal matrix. But in some models, that's not how it works. So for example, in a Mellitz model or a Hoppenheim model, you pay the entry cost, but you don't know what you end up with. So maybe you enter into an industry that you know about, but you don't get the high productivity that you were hoping for, or you get a worse production technology. This zeta sort of allows us to encompass all of these possibilities at the same time. So these entrants, they might actually end up with multiple production functions when they pay the entry costs. And you can use this to think about joint production, or you can use it to think about dynamic models where you pay the entry cost once, and then you get access to the technology over time. So these entrants, once they've entered, they then have to decide whether or not they wanna pay overhead costs and produce. And again, we can make this quite abstract so it can capture dynamic uh, overheads as well as static ones. And then your production technology, if you're a producer of type I, is just some neoclassical production function that says you have to use some inputs from other producers. And these inputs could be intermediates, but they might also be a primary factor, so labor and capital and whatever else you have. And then there's gonna be these Higgs neutral productivity shifters for the individual producers. And then finally, we're gonna assume there are industry aggregators that are aggregating over producers of a given type with some potentially nonlinear function at end. Um, and so you can think if you have like a CES type economy, it has a structure that looks like this. Basically, there is a nonlinear aggregator that everybody else is buying from. But you could make this linear, in which case it would look like a Hoppenheim type economy, where these I's are perfect substitutes and you just add them up to get the industry group. The household, as I said, is gonna be pretty, pretty boring. There's a representative household that maximizes a homothetic aggregator uh, of consumption goods and has to pay for their consumption expenditures. So at this level of generality, this model really nests a lot of different things. So it nests the Hoppenheim model, it nests the closed economy Mellets model, it nests lots of different kinds of endogenous growth models like Romer and Grossman Helpman. And it also nests various kinds of input output models and production network models that people have been writing. Okay, so the idea is to try to get a feeling for how this model is gonna behave. So first I'm gonna start off by thinking about a particularly important benchmark case, which is where we impose marginal cost pricing. Now in this economy, marginal cost pricing may not be a natural decentralization of the economy, but we can impose it and see what it entails. So if you impose marginal cost pricing, then you actually find that this economy is gonna be Pareto efficient. So this is useful because it tells you what optimal policy is. Optimal policy doesn't have to, first best optimal policy is in some sense gonna be network blind. So you don't need to think about forward and backward linkages if you wanna do ind optimal industrial policy here, you just need to ensure everybody sets price equal to marginal cost, market by market. So this is gonna be useful when we talk about policy in a few minutes, but it's also useful for thinking about comparative statics. Because the economy is efficient, comparative statics in this model with marginal cost pricing are gonna be very straightforward. Basically, Halton's theorem continues to hold even though you have all this complicated entry behavior. So if there's a Higgs neutral shifter to the variable production of some producer, real GDP moves by the sales share of that producer. And in fact, you can extend Halton's theorem in other directions. So for example, there's a Halton theorems for shocks to overhead and fixed costs and shocks to entry costs. So everything is very straightforward. Now what we wanna do is we wanna deviate from the marginal cost pricing equilibrium because that's obviously like a very special one and it's probably not the one that we should be focusing on in most cases. So for the purposes of the talk, I'm gonna narrow the scope of discussion a little bit. Uh, you could do this more generally, but it, but it helps to, to narrow things a bit. I'm gonna assume that every market is either produced according to a CES aggregator, or which I'm gonna call in, increasing returns to scale, or it's produced according to decreasing returns to scale with a linear aggregator. So basically, if you like, Every market either looks like a Mellitz model or it looks like a Hoppenheim model. Either we put the curvature in the demand side or we put the curvature in the supply side. And then we keep arbitrary wedges floating around which are gonna be markups and taxes and what have you. 
And what we find, what I'm about to show you on the next slide, is that the way real GDP is going to respond to shocks is no longer just given by sales shares. It's now going to depend on changes in rents and changes in quasi-rents. I'm going to define what I mean by rents and quasi-rents. What do I mean by rents? I basically mean variable profits. So for every market, there's a certain amount of sales that this market produces, and there's a profit margin that the producers of this type have. And so the, the rents that the producers are getting is just the profit margin times sales. And this is variable profits. What do I mean by quasi rents? By quasi rents, I mean the portion of variable profits that are offset by entry costs. So they're not like true rents because you have to pay your fixed cost in order to operate. So to define quasi rents in this model, we need the reverse conditional probability that I introduced earlier. So remember, we had a probability that said, if you're entrant J, what is the probability you get production technology I? We can flip this around and say, using Bayes' law, if you're looking at product I, what's the probability it was produced by entrant J? So this gives you a reverse conditional probability. And it turns out that quasi rents in the model to a first order are gonna be a projection of the changes in variable profits or the changes in rents on this entry matrix. So what is going on here? The way to think about it is, is like in equilibrium, rents are changing. Some markets are earning more profits, some markets are earning less profits. And entry wants to respond to this. Entry wants to flow into the places where profitability is increased. But whether entry can do that or not depends on the entry technology. So if the entry technology, if this Zeta, for example, if there's as many entrants as there are product types, then this projection will exactly uncover the original changes in rents. But if this production technology is limited, and for example, Amazon is making a lot of money and making a lot of profit, but I cannot enter as Amazon, then the quasi rents don't increase by as much as variable profits do. Okay, and so one way you can think about this is the projection is quasi rents. It's like in a least square sense, the entry is trying to go to places where profits have increased. And the residual is like the pure rents. It's what's left over when you subtract quasi rents from rents. Now here's what the general form formula looks like for how output is gonna respond. In this case, I'm gonna show it to you for productivity shocks, but it also, you can prove a similar thing for wedges. So suppose we have a bunch of productivity shocks in our economy. We want to understand how real GDP is going to respond. The first thing that's going to happen is there's a term that looks very much like Halton's theorem. Basically, you take some notion of domar weights. In this case, it's cost-based domar weights rather than revenue-based domar weights. And you multiply it by the productivity shocks. And loosely speaking, this is what Halton's theorem would give you. And if the economy were efficient, we know this is all you would get. There's nothing else for you to worry about. But it turns out if the economy is inefficient, there's some extra terms. There's one term that depends on pure rents, which is the difference between rents and quasi rents. And there's one term that depends on quasi rents. And notice that the summation goes over the Hoppenheim industries for the, for the pure rents, and it goes over the CES Dixit Stiglitz industries for the quasi rents. So for the increasing returns to scale industries, you want to know how quasi rents are changing. For decreasing returns to scale industries, you want to know how pure rents are changing. Now, to give you some intuition for what these terms represent, the first part, the Halton term, is basically what happens if you just scale up the allocation with the technology shocks, but you don't change, you don't reallocate any scarce resources. In that world, you get this is the full effect. Of course, in equilibrium, there's going to be some reallocation. But when the first welfare theorem holds, those reallocations are irrelevant and they don't have any effect because of the envelope theorem. But as soon as you have inefficiencies, the reallocations that take place have first order effects. And these, the second and third line, are the consequences of these reallocation effects. So in the paper, what we do is we provide formulas for these changes in rents and quasi rents in terms of the microeconomic primitives, which is to say in terms of the input output matrix and the elasticities of substitution and so on. 
So just to get some intuition for what these terms are, are representing, I think it's helpful to focus on special cases. So first we can start off by focusing on a special case where all the markets look like hope and high markets. So everything is just decreasing returns. There's no level variety effect. We're just dealing with uh, an economy that looks like that. Well, in that case, the second summation disappears. And the only thing you care about is the changes in pure rents. What's the intuition? If you see that pure rents have increased somewhere, that means that somebody is now operating at higher scale. And these guys have diminishing returns to scale. So the fact that they're making higher profits is telling you that they've hit diminishing returns harder than they used to. And that's gonna be a drag on output. These reallocation effects are gonna disappear if you have targeted entry. Because if you have targeted entry, there's no residual in your regression. For Dixit Stiglitz style models or CS models, it works differently. There's no diminishing returns at the micro level for you to worry about. Instead, what you're thinking about is what the consequences are from these variety effects when you have increased entry into a marketplace. And so here, what it's telling you is if you have a lot of entry into the marketplace, then quasi rents are gonna go up. And if quasi rents are going up, there's gonna be a level variety effect that makes goods cheaper, which boosts output, okay? Okay, so that's the sort of basic gist of how the model works in terms of its positive properties. Now what we want to do is we want to use these formulas to think about what the policy implications are uh, and what the misallocation consequences are of having these kinds of forces operating in the model. So the first thing we can do is we know very easily what optimal policy is going to be in this model. Efficiency is going to be restored if you make sure that every producer is pricing at marginal cost. Now, um, in the case of a CES aggregator, this is a little trickier than it sounds. The reason is, if I go back to how you would think about a CES aggregator in this model, a CES aggregator would have a nonlinear industry level aggregator here. Okay. So marginal cost pricing means that this aggregator has to set price equal to marginal cost. But when you write a CES model, oftentimes price is not equal to marginal cost for this aggregator because the aggregators, they don't make any profits or losses. They actually set prices equal to average cost. That's for example, how Dix at Stiglitz micro found the, the production technology they have. The aggregators end up charging average cost rather than marginal costs. And so if you want to restore efficiency in a model that has curvature in preferences, that basically means that you're going to have to undo the average cost pricing that the aggregator is doing. But that's all you need to do. So the average cost pricing that the aggregator is doing basically means that the aggregators are going to be charging a, a, a markup, which has to do with how curved the, the aggregator is. And you just have to undo that. And if you undo that, then you get efficiency in this model. So then the obvious question is, okay, well then what are the consequences from misallocation? If we know that in general, especially if you have CES aggregators, you're not gonna get efficiency, then what are the losses from the inefficiencies? So it turns out that there's actually a very nice formula for the inefficiencies, which have a very neoclassical flavor. Basically the losses to society from inefficiencies are just the sum of a whole bunch of deadweight loss triangles. So the loss function is going to be a sum of some deadweight loss triangles associated with distortions that arise due to variable production. So little y is the amount that an individual producer is producing, and this is the size of the wedge. So here you have base times height times a half, that's a triangle. You add up these triangles using the Domar weights, which is to say the sales shares. But then there's some extra triangles that you don't get in neoclassical models without entry, which have to do with the entry margin. And so there's distortions in terms of the number of firms that have entered into every kind of market. This is measured by M and there's a wedge associated with that. And so again, you go base times high times a half, it gives you a deadweight loss triangle and the amount of entry and you weight those by the Domar weight of those producers. And so you get a sum of Harberger triangles which loosely speaking, you can think of distortions on the variable edge and uh, distortions due to the extensive margin. And again, in the paper, we're able to actually characterize this in terms of things like what the input output network looks like and what the elasticities of substitution are. 
So I don't have much time. So I'm just going to show you some examples to give you a flavor for what, when you apply this formula to specific examples, what sorts of things you end up with. Um, so here's a simple example. Suppose we have a single sector model. It's sort of a Dixit Stiglitz model. So there's some elasticity of substitution theta, and then firms are just entering into this single CES aggregate. And we want to know what the losses are from misallocation. Now, if you have a model without any kind of entry, then the losses from misallocation are very familiar, especially if you've spent time looking at the misallocation literature. The losses from misallocation are a half times the elasticity of substitution times the dispersion in, markup, in wedges. So the variance of the wedges are the things that are going to drive misallocation. The higher, the more dispersed are the wedges, the bigger are the losses in TFP. Now, notice that in this example, the level of the wedges is irrelevant. The only thing you care about for TFP losses is dispersion in the wedges. Now, let's think about what happens if we allow entry into this model. And suddenly, you get an extra term. And this extra term now depends on the level of the wedges. So it's sort of the variance plus the square of the second moment, or if you like, the bias in the, in the average wedge. And so you can see that if the, if the average wedge is distorting the amount of entry that can take place, because for example, markups are too high or markups are too low relative to what would be socially optimum, then, then you're gonna get additional losses. We can extend this, of course, we can have multi-sector models, we can have input-output models. So let's say we take that model and we now make it into a multi-sector model. So now there's lots of CES industries. Um, each of them has an elasticity of substitution associated with it. And then there's a big elasticity of substitution theta zero across the sectors. And again, you can derive formulas without entry and with entry, and they're gonna look very different. So in fact, which elasticities even matter is gonna change whether you have entry or not. So without entry, for example, the elasticity of substitution across sectors shows up. With entry, it doesn't even show up. So if you, I mean, I don't have time to kind of get into it, but basically these losses, there can be very rich patterns that come out of the model, depending on what you decide to do with the entry margin. And in general, one of the intuitions in the misallocation literature that's so far sort of universally held is violated, which is that it, the losses to society from wedges are no longer going to be monotone in the elasticity of substitution. So one of the things that people find in the misallocation literature is if you pump up the elasticity of substitution, you pump up the losses. That's no longer true when you have an entry margin. Okay, so I'm almost out of time. So I'm just gonna try to quantify these to show you how much they matter. So we take a firm level model of the economy, we populate, it's an input output at the industry level economy and we populate the industries with firms from CopyStat. And then we estimate markups at the firm level and we assign it to these firms. And then we look at what happens. We put some elasticities of substitution that are reasonable across the different levels of uh, the production function. And then we estimate what happens to output and, and aggregate TFP as you eliminate these markups and go to first best. And here's what we find. So the left column is what happens if you shut down entry. The right column is what happens if you allow for entry. Now, IRS, this is when everything is Dixit Stiglitz or CES style. DRS is when everything is Hoppenheim style. And oftentimes people think these are like just taste, it depends on your taste, like you can pick one or the other and they're sort of going to do the same thing. But actually it makes a big difference. As I showed you even in our formulas, which sufficient statistics matter are really different in general. So one thing you can see is that when you open the door to entry, the, the losses are greatly magnified. And the reason here is because the existence of the wedges now not only is distorting the allocation of resources across firms, it's also distorting the number of firms that you have uh, of every firm type. And here, the numbers I'm showing you is with an elasticity of substitution within industries of approximately four. Uh, with a Hoppenheim setup, this means a returns to scale of approximately 0.75, which I think are both reasonable. But what I can also show you is that the losses are non-monotone in these elasticities. So these are the losses to society at approximately four, uh, when the elasticity is four and you have CES, you get something that's like 32, that's here. But what you can see is as I lower the elasticity, the losses are actually magnified. And as I increase the elasticity, the losses are also magnified. 
in traditional models, this is always monotone. You don't get this non-monotonicity. Intuitively, what's happening is as I lower the elasticity of substitution, the level of variety effect is becoming stronger. And that means that screwing up the correct number of varieties is more and more costly. And that's why this is increasing as we, as we lower the elasticity. So I'm basically out of time. In the paper, we also consider second best policies. I don't have enough time, I think, to, to, to get into that. Uh, but basically, with second best policies, you can show that there are potentially very big gains and, they, and the kinds of policies that are optimal are very reminiscent of Albert Hirschman's kind of forward backward linkage arguments that he used to make that were never formalized. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, so in this paper, we provide uh, a, a theory of aggregation that works when you have entry and exit and non-trivial returns to scale. We also provide formulas for how shocks propagate from one sector to another that I didn't have time to show you. But you know, the big overarching message I think that I'd like to communicate is that these entry margins are really, really powerful and they can change the answers to both micro and macro questions. And so we really need to do more, I think, to understand uh, how, they, how they work. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. That was exactly on time. Um, the second paper is Rents and Intangible Capital, a Q plus framework by, uh, presented by Miko. Right, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so thanks a lot for putting the, the paper on the program. It's a great pleasure and um, an honor to be here. Um, so this is titled uh, Rents and Intangible Capital, the Q plus framework, and it's joined with Jan, who's, uh, who's in the audience. So in this paper, we're asking a, a simple question, which is um, why has investment in property, plant, and equipment, so traditional investment, been so weak in the US since the early 2000s? So first of all, what do I mean by weak? Uh, so here's some data. Um, so this is from two different sources, uh, the BEA and CompuStat. Um, the, it shows that gross investment rates among non-financial corporations used to be about 12 to 14 percentage points before the 2000s, they fall into about eight to 10 percentage points now. now. Of course, the observation that investment is weak on its own is not super interesting. Um, maybe there are just few positive NPV opportunities out there. What makes the weakness of investment puzzling is that there's a bunch of measures of returns to physical capital and of the incentive to invest physical assets more generally that seem to have been rising. So here's a simple example, or the simplest example. This is average returns to physical capital. So again, uh, two sources here, aggregated data from CompuStat and data from the BEA. Uh, for CompuStat, uh, average returns are defined as a EBITDA divided by the stock of physical assets. Uh, for the BEA, it's the gross operating surplus of non-financial firms divided by their stock, the stock of their physical assets. And measured in this way, average returns to, to physical assets rose from about 18 to 20 percentage points before the 2000s to over 24 or so now. Okay, so investments declining despite the fact that measures of the returns to physical capital are rising, which is a bit of a puzzle. Um, so there's two potential explanations that people have zeroed in on. The first one is what I'm going to call the economic rents hypothesis. Um, so, you know, this is the idea that firms ability to generate pure what David before was calling pure rents has been on the rise over the past two decades. The source of these rents is a matter of debate, but its consequences for investment are clear. If a firm has market power, it has less incentive to invest or to increase scale at the margin. So investment will be weak. And at the same time, rents are gonna boost uh, measured capital income and drive up measured returns. The second hypothesis is the intangibles hypothesis. So in this view, the, what's been going on is the production function in many industries has changed over time, moving away from physical capital and toward intangible capital. And as a result, the relationship between physical investment and measures of returns to physical capital has become uh, distorted, biased essentially. So intangibles is kind of a, a fuzzy concept. So let me just say a couple of words about it. The term is from accounting and it refers to um, all uh, productive capital that doesn't have a physical presence. So this can include a wide variety of different assets. Uh, so, you know, things like software, intellectual property, brands, uh, business uh, processes, like say inventory management systems, uh, 
So measuring all of this is notoriously difficult. And you know, we do have some proxies and those suggest that uh, the stock of this type of capital has been on the rise over the last three decades. So for instance, if you measure uh, the stock of, or the capitalized value of past R&D expenditures, again, in BEA and CompuStat data, relative to the stock of physical assets, you find that that ratio has increased by about two thirds since uh, the early 1980s. Okay, so um, what are we gonna do in this paper? Um, is we're gonna try and sort of tell these two hypotheses apart. So just quickly, sorry, the intangibles, the rise in intangibles um, is going to distort the relationship between physical investment and measured returns to physical capital because the measures of the incentive to invest in physical assets we typically use are something like total firm value divided by physical assets or total uh, firm profits divided by physical assets. So the numerator will capture returns to both intangible and physical capital, whereas the denominator is only going to capture returns or it's only going to capture the stock of physical assets. So it's going to generally be an upward biased measure of the true incentive to invest. So what we're gonna do in this paper is we're gonna try and tell the two hypotheses apart. So we're gonna take a super simple approach. Uh, we're gonna build a neoclassical investment model that's gonna have both intangibles and uh, pure rents. And then we're gonna use it to quantify the contribution uh, of each of these two forces uh, to the divergence between investment and returns. So today I wanna to walk you through some theoretical and some empirical results. Let me just briefly summarize them. Um, so in the theory, we're going to focus on one key object, uh, which I'm going to call uh, the investment gap. So this is going to be the gap between the average Q of physical assets. So the ratio of total firm value to the replacement cost of the physical capital stock and the marginal Q of physical assets, which is the incremental firm value associated with an incremental unit of firm capital. So our main theoretical result is this gap is always the sum of three pieces basically three reasons why average Q might be above marginal Q. The first is that traditional physical assets generate rents. Um, so that's gonna create a wedge between average and marginal Q, and that's going to distort uh, the incentive to invest away from uh, average Q. The second reason is that the firm might have installed intangible capital and installed intangibles are gonna boost firm value and hence average Q of physical assets, but not the marginal Q of physical assets. So that's also going to add to the wedge. And then there's gonna be a third term, uh, which is a combination of the first two effects. What it reflects is the NPV of future rents that are generated by the intangible capital stock of the firm and which further boosts firm value and hence uh, the average, the gap between average and marginal Q uh, for physical assets. So the first two terms, the rents to physical capital and the omitted capital effect, those were well understood in the literature. The third one, is new and it only appears in the model when you combine the two stories. And then what we do in the rest of the paper is we apply this decomposition to the data. So we're gonna start with aggregated data from the non-financial sector. And there, what we're going to find is that about between about one third and two thirds of the investment gap is due to, um, to the intangibles related terms. So terms number two and number three is the composition. So one third is the number when we, we obtain when we use just data from the BA fixed asset tables. Two thirds is the number we obtain when we use data aggregated from CompuStat. And as I'll explain, the difference is driven uh, by essentially how broadly you can define uh, the intangible capital stock uh, with CompuStat data, you can be a little broader. Our second result though is uh, looking at the aggregate uh, investment gap is a little bit misleading because there's this huge, there are very large differences across sectors in the composition of the investment gap. So for instance, in the two fastest growing sectors in our data, um, which are healthcare and tech, two thirds of the gap come from, gaps come from intangibles. By contrast, there's almost no role for intangibles in retail and manufacturing. Uh, I'll discuss toward the end that the sectoral differences are important because they kind of cast doubt on whether you should think of the investment gap um, as something that could motivate broad policy implications. Um, it seems to be heterogeneous enough across sectors that uh, you should have some caution in drawing aggregate implications. So the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention in passing is our approach gives us a new way of estimating the pure profit share, which is a number that people have paid a lot of attention to in recent years. Our approach is a little different from existing approaches because it relies on firm valuations as a source of information on, on pure profits. And what we're gonna find is lower estimates than uh, other recent work. So I'll, I'll explain why we get that. All right, so the theory is very simple. Um, so it's basically a general, quite general Q theory model. 
think of it as a, of the, as a problem of a, a single firm. Uh, the firm has um, one endogenous state, which is a vector bold KT of capital stocks. It's of arbitrary size. I'm going to use two capital stocks when I give you concrete examples, but um, the, the theory works more broadly. And then these capital stocks are going to be aggregated into a capital index, which is the non-bold KT here. That's a, this is a, a real number. So this is this non-bold KT by some function f. So the only thing we want from this function f is that it's a, um, a constant returns to scale aggregator. And then EBITDA uh, of the firm is going to be given by a function pi of uh, this index of capital KT. Then finally, the firm is going to maximize the present value of distributions to its owners, which are equal to the difference between EBITDA, so pi of KT, and total investment cost, which is this big function here. Okay, so we are going to ask three things of the model to get our results. The first one, as I mentioned already, is that the aggregator has to be the capital aggregator has to be the homogeneous degree one. The second one is that the, the profit function, the EBITDA function, um, has to be homogeneous of degree one over mu. So this parameter mu is going to be uh, uh, an index in this model of pure rents or market power. Uh, I'll explain why in a second. And third, uh, total investment costs have to satisfy some assumptions about separability and convexity. So this turns out to be a fairly um, general model, but it misses roughly three things, non-convex adjustment costs, potentially financial frictions, and most importantly, models where uh, firms' market power can evolve over time or is endogenous to past investments. So here it's fixed over time within the firm. Okay, so in this model, you can derive a general value of uh, the general result, sorry, on basically the sources of firm value. So this is the, the equation here. Um, I've specialized it to two, uh, two capital stocks to make things clear. Um, so to see what the, this expression means, um, just let me first imagine that mu is equal to one. So in this case, this big sum here that I'll explain in a second goes to zero and you're left with uh, these two terms and that's just uh, the sum of the value of installed capital across the two capital stocks. So this is the traditional Hayashi result uh, in the case of two capital stocks. Now, um, imagine that you turn on the rents parameter so that mu is larger than one, then you see that firm value is equal to the value of installed capital plus this big present value term here. So I've highlighted the key term in that sum in yellow. If you do the math, what you can show is that um, this is just the gap between average and marginal products uh, of capital of type N, uh, which we think of as the basically the flow value of pure rents generated by capital of type N. So it's going to be positive whenever average product is above marginal product and zero otherwise. So we're a little agnostic about the micro foundation for these rents. This could be rents due or this could be uh, driven by decreasing returns. Uh, it could come from pricing power. Um, but either way, we think of that, that flow term as, as pure rents. So crucially, what you see in this theorem is that these rents are additively separated across capital types. This comes from the, basically the envelope theorem and, and the uh, CES aggregator. Um, so we can think of, uh, of rents attributable to physical capital separately from rents attributable to intentions. So from this, we can derive our main result about average Tobin's Q. Um, so I'm going to denote uh, average Q of physical capital as BQ1, since it's the ratio of firm value to the replacement cost of physical assets. This is basically a proxy for average returns to capital in this model, uh, but it's not a good proxy for the incentive to invest. The correct proxy for the incentive to invest in this model is always marginal Q. So this is uh, little Q1 here. What we call uh, the, the investment gap is just going to be the difference. And so I'm going to walk you through the pieces that enter this difference. So uh, first of all, imagine you take the version of the model that has neither intangibles nor rents, so just one capital type and mu equals to one, then average and marginal Q are equal and you're in the Hayashi world. Now imagine you uh, still work with one capital type, but you add in rents. Uh, then what you have is the Lindner, Brink, and Ross 81 result that says that average Q is larger than marginal Q by exactly the NPV of uh, future flow rents. Now, shutdown rents allow for two capital types. Uh, what you have is again a wedge between average and marginal Q, but this wedge is entirely due to the value of existing intangibles um, in, in the firm. So this is a variation on the result by Hayashi and Inoue in 91. And then when you put the three stories together, you have the first two pieces, sorry, the two stories together, you have the first two pieces and you have a third piece, which is um, basically capturing the NPV of future rents generated by intangibles or attributable to intangibles, multiplied by uh, the relative stock of intangibles to physical capital. 
Um, so basically what we're gonna be interested in in the rest of the talk is to put numbers on each of these three pieces. Uh, so to do that, um, we're gonna use um, not a completely general version, uh, but we're gonna of the model, but we're gonna specialize to a balanced growth version of it. So this is a version where I'm gonna assume that firm productivity grows at some constant uh, rate uh, G and there are no other shocks. And moreover, I'm going to assume that uh, the stochastic discount factor is constant equal to one over one plus R. So in this case, you have a much simpler formula for the decomposition. Um, so uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, basically all the important ratios are, are constant. Uh, the NPV of rents is going to boil down to a simple Gordon growth formula. Um, the variables that I denoted by RI here are basically uh, user costs. Uh, there are R plus delta plus an adjustment cost, um, basically a term that captures the value of the, the or the cost of continuously um, adjusting the capital stock along the balance growth path. And the flow uh, value of rents is just going to be nu minus one times the user cost of uh, physical capital. Um, the intangible capital stock is going to be, uh, the, sorry, the omitted intangibles effect is going to be simply uh, given by this expression. The ratio here is going to be constant. And then the last term, the, the, uh, the, inter the interaction term is going to be the product of this ratio times the flow value of rents generated by intentions. Okay, so now I'm gonna to move to empirics with the time I've got left, so about 10 minutes or so. Um, so I'm gonna start with national accounts data. So what we wanna do is basically put numbers in each of these three pieces of the decomposition to figure out where the divergence between valuations and, and marginal Q or investment rates is coming from. So our approach is to use a small uh, number of data moments. Uh, so we're doing something that's deliberately simple and deliberately to, to make it as transparent as possible. So the first thing is we're gonna use a measure of the stock of intangibles. So we're not going to infer it as a residual though in principle we could do that too. Instead, we're gonna tie our hands and use the BEA's measure which includes only capitalized expenditures uh, uh, in R&D by firms. So this is a relatively narrow measure of intangible capital. I'll, I'll mention bigger ones later on. So that's gonna be our measure for the ratio K2 over K1. So the second thing we need then is an estimate of mu. So for this, we're gonna use the fact that along the balanced growth path, mu is basically going to be the wedge between average returns to capital measured as flow profits divided by physical capital and a weighted average of user costs. So we can measure directly uh, average returns, the ROA uh, that, I, that I put at the bottom of the slide. But how do we get user costs? So for this, we're gonna use kind of a simple trick, which is uh, user cost. So this is the, the case without uh, convex adjustment cost. User cost is just R plus delta. You can rewrite this as R minus G plus G plus delta. R minus G uh, doesn't depend on the type of capital and G plus delta on the balanced growth path is just the um, gross investment rate in capital of type N. So we can measure the gross investment rate. We're gonna get it from the BEA. What we're left with is having to figure out the value of R minus G. And so there we're going to uh, essentially uh, use the, an inverted version of the decomposition above. So we're gonna back out R minus G from the value of Q. So from the value of Tobin's Q, the ratio of firm value to the stock of physical capital. Okay, so, um, so this is gonna give us by construction an additive decomposition of the investment gap uh, as, I, as I put at the top of the slide. So, you know, we need relatively little data. So just these five moments, uh, what we're gonna do then is we're gonna compute these five moments over seven year rolling windows of data and then construct the decomposition year by year. So when we do this, um, this is the, the graph we obtain. So this is the case of no adjustment costs. So the line with the crosses represents our estimates of the investment gap. So this is uh, for, this is, as I mentioned, the case of no, um, of no adjustment costs. So you see three, uh, blue shaded areas uh, below the, the line with the crosses. So the darker blue corresponds to the term that captures rents attributable to physical capital. The intermediate is the value of uh, installed intangibles, so the direct omitted capital effect. And then the light blue is are the rents associated with intangible capital. So there are three things worth noting. First, there are two periods of elevated investment gap, uh, the post 85 period, and then the 60 to 75 period. Second, during these two periods, uh, rents attributable to, tra to traditional assets, tra physical assets seem to be the biggest factor. Third though, after 85, the contribution of intangibles increases from about 23% to about 36% uh, after the 2000s. So most of the increase is coming from the interaction terms so this interaction effect between rents and, and intangibles. So remember, these, this is just using a narrow measure of intangibles uh, 
Uh, so we view this as kind of like the lower bound, um, the contribution of intangibles to the investment gap. So what's going on briefly behind the hood? So we can use the model, put a bit more structure on the model to, to, to interpret the, these results more. So you can specialize the model uh, to back out a share of intangible capital in the production function. So we're going to assume a cup Douglas aggregator across capital stocks. And then um, you can compute also just the pure rents as, uh, as a fraction of value added by introducing labor in the model. And so what you get are, are these two underlying trends uh, that I've plotted in the two panels. So after 85, the first trend is that intangible intensity is rising. This is the left panel. Basically, over the past 30 years, intangible intensity, so the, the Cobb Douglas share, rose um, much more rapidly than from 45 to 85. Now, the second trend is what you see on the right panel, which is that pure rents also have risen since 1980. However, the increase we find, you know, it's sizable, but it's more modest than some other papers. What we find is about seven percentage points higher pure profits now than in uh, 1980. So, uh, you know, in this paper, uh, we're basically at the lower end of uh, recent estimates of these uh, of this increase in, in pure profits or pure rents as a fraction of value added. Most papers tend to find something in the range of 12% to you know, much bigger numbers for some of the other estimates. And the reason why our estimate is lower is basically down to discount rates. So the discount rate implied by our approach declines after 85, but less so than the risk-free rate. And so our user costs fall after 85, but less than existing estimates. And since rents are essentially just uh, measured capital income minus user costs, we infer smaller rents. So remember, our discount rates essentially come from Q, or R minus G essentially comes from the value of Q. So one way to think of our findings is that they require a slight increase in risk premia over the period. And that's something that a number of recent macro finance papers have highlighted. So there's a lot more paper uh, on the paper on this, but these are the, the key findings. OK, so um, with the, the time I have left, I'm going to just talk about uh, uh, results in uh, firm level data. So uh, first, let's look at uh, how the investment gap changes when you expand the definition of intangibles. Um, so to set th things up, I'm going to start with a very similar measure to the BEA, so R&D capital stock, but I'm going to just apply it to publicly traded firms. Uh, why publicly traded firms? Because we have better data on, um, on intangible investment amongst these firms. But I just want to set up the baseline so we can compare national accounts data with firm level data. And so what you find is very much the same picture as in national accounts data. So rise in the, in the investment gap after 85 and about one third of it due to intangibles, two thirds due to traditional rents. Okay, so after now we can uh, repeat this exercise with an expanded definition of intangibles to include what the literature has called organization capital. So this we can compute only using um, uh, firm level data and we follow the methodology of, of uh, the important work of Andrea uh, Icefield and Dimitris Stava Nicolaou, and basically we capitalize a portion of SGNA expenditures net of R&D. So what this is meant to capture is investment in workforce, human capital, brand capital, customer relationships, and, and distribution systems. Um, now, using that alternative uh, measure of intangible capital, but otherwise the same set of firms and the same procedure, what we find is a much bigger role for uh, intangible capital. So about 67% of the gap is now due to the two intangible related terms, about twice as much as, as the baseline. What this also does is it compresses substantially estimates of the markup. So I don't have time to show you this, but uh, in this uh, procedure, what we find is um, that the fraction of rents to value added uh, in 2015 is only about three to 4% instead of 8% or 7% in, uh, in our baseline analysis. Okay, so that's the first advantage of looking at publicly traded firms. You can do this broader definition of organization capital. The other advantage is you can disaggregate things across sectors. Um, so what we're gonna do for this is uh, we're gonna use still a fairly broad level of aggregation, but one that we think is still economically meaningful. So there are gonna be some real differences in, or there are likely to be real differences in the production functions across these, these sectors. So we're gonna look at the first four of the Fama French Five. So uh, consumer sector, which is essentially the retail sector, the high tech sector. So um, uh, think of it as you know, uh, software firms, for instance, will be in that sector, the healthcare sector, and then the traditional manufacturing sector. So the main point we want to make here um, is uh, that the trends are very heterogeneous across sectors. So here I'm plotting the same uh, decomposition of the investment gap sector by sector. And my definition of intangibles is just R&D capital. Um, so 
you know, one extreme is the manufacturing sector, which is on the bottom right. So there, the investment gap has actually been decreasing since the since roughly 2005. Um, both intangible intensity and markups seem to have de been declining in that sector. The other extreme is the consumer sector, which is on the top left. So there, the investment gap is rising, uh, but the decomposition suggests that it's entirely due to rents. Um, so basically, the intangible related terms uh, only account for 10% of the gap. And then finally, uh, tech and healthcare look much more like the aggregate trends, an increase in the gap with a rise in contribution of intangibles. The difference in healthcare and high tech is intangibles account for more of the gap than in aggregate. For instance, they account for about 70% of the gap in healthcare. So our takeaway from this is that the aggregate gap might be sort of misleading. What it's masking is um, there are big industry differences uh, that are substantial and, and probably um, more important than any common within industry trends. So basically that's it for this paper. I've summarized the key takeaway on this slide. Just taking a step back for a second, why do we think these findings are interesting? Uh, well, we think they feed into a broader debate about whether market power is rising in the US. Uh, this debate has some very concrete policy implications. And for us, it's important to understand whether the behavior of investment versus returns in token skew is actually informative for this debate or whether instead uh, that behavior reflects some ongoing changes in the way production is organized in the US. So we think of our results as saying that maybe you shouldn't worry too much about this investment gap since as much as two thirds of it seems to be driven by um, the growing importance of intangibles, particularly in high growth industries. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention and we look forward to comments and questions. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, if you can unshare. So the third paper is my joint work with Amir Karmani on asset specificity of non-financial firms. And we will continue some of the themes from the previous presentation. In this paper, we investigate the classic issue of the heterogeneity and specificity of firm's capital, which is a fundamental feature of production assets in practice. And asset specificity has been well recognized to be important for a number of issues in economics. It is central to the research on investment irreversibility and the impact of uncertainty shocks it also is very important for contracts, including debt and firm organization. In addition, it can affect how we think about reallocation, misallocation, which is evident from the COVID-19 shutdowns. And uh, finally, I've also learned from the work of David and Emmanuel, um, the Cambridge Cambridge capital controversy and the long intellectual history in macroeconomics uh, about thinking about the specificity of capital. However, a major challenge for understanding asset specificity and the implications is limited data. How do we know the value of different assets if they were displaced? And how do we know if asset specificity is higher in one setting than others? So um, the literature has tried to explore a variety of indirect proxies, but direct measurement has been relatively sparse. And the lack of data poses um, challenges for both empirical and theoretical analyses. In this paper, we tackle this challenge. And we start by collecting new data to measure directly and systematically asset specificity across different industries and for different types of assets in the form of liquidation value relative to replacement cost. And after collecting a rich set of data, we start by asking the upstream question, which is the key determinants and the economics of asset specificity. Across different industries, we find that the physical attributes of assets that are required by the production in different industries have substantial explanatory power for the variations across industries. And these physical attributes can be measured using additional data from different sources. Over time, macro and industry conditions also have some impact, and that also turns out to be dependent on the physical attributes. 
And then we ask the downstream questions of understanding the various, uh, the various implications of asset specificity, starting from the classic issue of investment irreversibility and the impact of uncertainty shocks. And then we'll also show that our data has implications for understanding the new forms of investment that arise from rising intangibles, and in particular, what is fundamentally different and perhaps not different about intangibles. And finally, time permitting, we'll give an overall summary of other implications for thinking about debt contracts and borrowing constraints. So to fix ideas, what we measure in the data is the value in alternative use, the liquidation value relative to replacement cost. And this ratio, we'll call it liquidation recovery rate. In particular, it describes the nature of firms' assets. And this um, ratio maps into the key parameters in several classes of models. For example, in models of investment irreversibility, uh, we invest I, and when we disinvest, we recover lambda I, where lambda is essentially the liquidation recovery rate. Also in models of traditional collateral constraints where firms pledge their physical asset and borrow based on the liquidation value of those assets, you have asset uh, with cost K, and then you can borrow a lambda fraction of that. We also see that the numbers that have been used in models uh, in the literature have varied uh, pretty substantially from close to zero to close to one, which is perhaps an another indication that some empirical data could be helpful. In some other contexts, one may also uh, define asset specificity as value in alternative use relative to value in current use. And uh, the link between these two concepts is straightforward. In our data, it is much more difficult to precisely pin down the value in current use, in particular when firms have multiple types of assets, as you may have already uh, gotten a hint from Nico's presentation. Um, but to the extent that value in current use tends to be greater than the cost, um, you can think about uh, our data as providing a rough upper bound for this alternative um, definition. So now let me describe the data. Um, we spent uh, a few years of time to collect data on the liquidation values of all types of assets across industries. And one of the most systematic sources of disclosure is court filings associated with US Chapter 11 cases. So in Chapter 11, firms do uh, largely financial restructuring. In particular, they don't die. They do continue to operate and um, the, the firm stays there. Um, however, they are required by law to also provide a systematic assessment of the liquidation value of all the things that they have and report it. And the law also says that um, all parties in financial restructuring should receive no less than what they would receive in liquidation. So this assessment gives us the liquidation value of everything the firm has. Um, and liquidation means that this, the firm would stop operations and sell off all of their assets on a largely piecemeal basis. So essentially the liquidation value of everything and we normalize it by book value of uh, each type of asset. Of course, ideally we want to ask the question to every firm, what is the liquidation value of everything that you have if you were to liquidate everything? Um, however, that is not feasible to the best of our knowledge. And you might ask whether firms going through chapter 11 are special in some ways, and we will do um, extensive uh, checks to verify the informativeness of the data. Ultimately, we find that there are quite consistent characters associated with the assets, in particular physical assets used in different industry required by the type of production. And the information that we obtain here does generalize pretty well to firms in general. And as we will show later, they explain the behavior of firms in general, for example, firms in CompuStat quite well. So once we have the industry level liquidation value relative to replacement cost, the liquidation recovery rate, we can uh, apply them to firms in general based on the industry. A, a, an example of the role data looks like this is uh, a case, uh, Line Dow Chemical, a pretty famous case. And uh, for all of these reporting, we see for each financial statement category, what's the net book value, what's the estimate of the low and high uh, 
uh, a midpoint value of each type of asset. And behind each of these numbers, there's a uh, extensive investigation. And for this case, they also provide a plant level assessment. But it's ultimately really helpful that people helped to summarize all the information up to the level of financial statement category like inventory and fixed asset so that we can apply them more generally. And after going through hundreds of cases, uh, this is the information that we see um, for fixed asset, uh, the average liquidation recovery rate, liquidation value as a fraction of replacement cost is 35%. So that's reasonably low. But there is quite a bit of variation. On the high end, you have transportation where cars and ships are pretty mobile and also standardized. On the low end, you have um, uh, services and manufacturing. For inventory, the uh, liquidation recovery rate is close to 45% on average. Again, with quite a bit of variation across industries. On the high end, there's auto dealer with car inventory and then retailers in general. And on the low end, you have restaurants where food inventory is quite perishable and also telecom and manufacturing where many things are specialized. So as I mentioned, we perform extensive checks to verify uh, the generality of the information here to the extent we have information from other types of sources. Uh, one of them is to cross check this with auction value whenever that's possible. There's a classic study by Remy Shapiro that investigates in detail auction values of aerospace manufacturing equipment. Our uh, findings for this category uh, matches very closely with them. Um, in addition, we obtained auction results of uh, several hundred thousand uh, construction equipment and match that with their uh, uh, original value uh, at manufacture at, at cost. And then we also find the results to be very similar. Uh, we also compare what we have here, which is assessment of liquidation value with the actual liquidation proceeds from corporate liquidations. Um, but unfortunately in this chapter seven corporate liquidations, there's only a very simple report documenting all um, receipts realized by the liquidating trustee, not much in detail which type of asset has what type of value, um, but by and large at the firm level, they match um, reasonably well. In addition, uh, in the US, when lenders lend against particular types of assets, for example, equipment and so on, um, they also start by doing assessment and appraisal of the liquidation value of what they're lending against and based on a large uh, US lender, the liquidation value that they've assessed of a, the fixed asset of uh, non-financial firms is 20 to 30% very close to the average in our data and similarly for inventory and other types of assets. So this reflects the liquidation value assessed by the lender for all types of non-financial firms that they come across and also quite similar. And finally, one can also uh, impute uh, the value sold uh, of, fixed, of fixed assets sold by CompuStat firms relative to the cost uh, on the book. Um, and uh, we also find it to be similar across industries um, by and large. In the CompuStat case, one doesn't know exactly what types of assets is being sold. Uh, and one advantage of our data is it captures all of the assets uh, owned by firms. So now with that, um, it's inevitable to ask what is the fundamental determinant of asset specificity, both the level and the variations across different industries that we saw. And we start with inevitable, which is the physical attributes associated with different types of assets in different industries, which vary quite a bit. And in particular, we'll measure three key physical attributes uh, using a combination of the BA's fixed asset table that documents what types of assets different industries have and the BA's input output table, which helps uh, evaluating some of these attributes. The first one is mobility, which is uh, coming from the transportation costs of different types of assets from the manufacturer to, uh, to from, from the producer to the purchaser. The second one is durability, which one can measure uh, pretty easily off of depreciation rate because reallocation takes time. And the typical time frame for reallocation in the analysis that I just showed you is one year. The third one is the degree of customization, which is measured off of the cost of design. And in particular, um, these 
attributes are measured off of all the, the firms in an industry, not any particular subset of firms. So here is a result of explaining the variations and the level of um, liquidation values. So the left-hand side is liquidation value relative to replacement cost, liquidation recovery rate, and here uh, fixed asset as the example. The right-hand side are the physical attributes. And we see that when transportation cost is higher, when depreciation cost is higher, or when the degree of customization is higher, liquidation value goes down. And these three attributes alone, even though admittedly uh, must be imperfectly measured, can account already for 40% of the cross industry variations in um, the industry average liquidation recovery rate. Also quite interestingly, we find that the constant is close to 100%, meaning that if you take away the reallocation frictions, if you have something that uh, is, uh, has no transportation costs, doesn't depreciate, and is not customized, the data would imply that such a thing would have close to 100 or slightly above 100% uh, recovery rate, so that will be fully generic. And similarly, if you use other definitions of industries. And finally, it's uh, often asked, what is the impact of macroeconomic and industry conditions? Uh, we find that interestingly, on average, there is an impact of uh, macro condition like GDP growth or industry condition like industry sales growth, industry leverage, but on average is relatively weak. However, it is much stronger for industries where assets are not customized to the firm. So the, uh, the basic observation is if you have something that's customized, like for example, my eyeglasses, they're not very useful to anybody else at any point in time. Um, whereas if you have something where, where the alternative buyers are populated across the economy or across the industry, then general economic condition and industry condition matters a lot more for the capacity of these uh, potential buyers. And uh, taking everything together to get a sense of magnitude, if you have something that's not customized to the firm, for one percentage point increase in GDP growth, uh, the liquidation recovery rate tends to increase by roughly five percentage points. And that also is very similar to what we see from the uh, hundreds of thousands of equipment auctions um, which is one example of things that are not really customized to the firm, um, that 1% increase in GDP growth leads to three-ish percentage points increase in the liquidation value. So with that, um, we've now understood the basics of what determines asset specificity. We'll move on to investigate the consequences and implications of asset specificity and variations in asset specificity. Starting with the classics, which is the uh, issue of investment irreversibility. And in all of this session, uh, we're, in this section, we're going to show that the data that we have collected has pretty substantial explanatory power for the behavior, in the investment behavior of firms, uh, for example, in CompuStat, and where the, the liquidation values are matched based on industry. So uh, we start with a verification that indeed when assets are more specialized, there are more frictions to disinvestment. What these plots show on the x-axis is the liquidation recovery rate of fixed asset in an industry. The y-axis is uh, the frequency of sales of fixed asset in the first panel and the magnitude of sales in the second panel um, relative to the capital stock. And in both cases, you see that when assets are more specific, the liquidation values are lower, you see a much uh, lower frequency of disinvestment. And similarly, you can instrument the uh, liquidation values using the physical attributes that we just discussed. And then a natural uh, consequence, an important one to study uh, that arises from investment irreversibility is the impact of uncertainty shocks. Um, here, we investigate that issue where the regression is investment rate on the uh, left-hand side and volatility, uh, which is a measure of uncertainty on the right-hand side and each observation is a firm year. And we see that the sensitivity of investment to uh, uncertainty uh, is mod modulated by the degree of asset specificity. The first two columns shows investment in fixed asset, um, where if you have something with zero liquidation recovery rate, very specific, then you have a significant negative impact 
coming from uh, asset specificity. Whereas if the recovery rate is 100%, then you need to add up these two coefficients and it adds up to close to zero. So if you have something that's fully generic, uh, then uncertainty shock doesn't have an impact. A similar uh, result holds for investment in inventory, which also is known to be an important driver of business cycles. And um, you see that there's a negative impact of volatility and uncertainty on, invest on inventory investment if the inventory is specific and no impact if it's generic. So the, um, the data shows in a quite precise way that the impact of uh, uncertainty shocks depends pretty substantially on asset specificity. And in addition, we also explore other types of uh, implications uh, for pricing and for other things. And one on the uh, other on the investment side, it's pretty natural to think that there, if there's more frictions in capital reallocation, then there will be more productivity dispersion. And that's also what we see in the data. And traditional investment theories of classics have been focused on uh, physical assets. And as Nico just mentioned, in over time, there's a rising prominence of intangible assets, a new form of investment. And Nico's work with Jen um, have taught us a lot about how to think about intangible assets. And we will um, also discuss some of our thoughts on what's different about intangibles and what's not. So to begin with, um, a definition of intangibles, as Nico mentioned, is production assets without physical presence. And within this broad tent of things, there are at least two categories, which to me may have different properties. Uh, one is that there are some things without physical presence, but they can be identifiable and separable, things like data and some software, usage rights, licenses, patent and trademark. Um, and there's another bucket, which is things that are not separable from the firm, like organizational capital. And these two types of things um, may manifest with different types of economic properties as I will discuss here. So when we look at the uh, existing work on rising intangibles, one of the main themes is the concern that when with higher intangibles, um, the liquidation of value, value of firms may go down and to the extent that firms uh, may borrow on the basis of liquidation value, there could be tighter borrowing constraints that that's a, a major concern so far. Um, although uh, in some work I previously did with Chen Lian, we showed that US firms do not necessarily borrow on the basis of liquidation value. Here we also find that rising intangibles may not be um, having a significant impact on liquidation value in the first place. So the sunkness of uh, intangibles uh, may not be as pronounced as you might otherwise think um, for three reasons. One is uh, we already show that uh, physical assets are pretty highly specific in the first place. On average, uh, we are replacing something with 35 cents of liquidation value, not 100 cents. And second reason is we're re replacing them with some things uh, intangible, some of which can have liquidation value and can exist on their own. Uh, as well, in particular, the ones that are separable, like licenses and trademarks and, and so on. And in particular, because they do not have physical presence, they do not need to incur transportation costs. So there's one fewer um, reallocation frictions when you reallocate these separable intangibles, and that actually helps them to obtain a comparable liquidation value relative to physical assets. And the third uh, reason is for a variety of reasons, rising intangible so far at least has been strongest in industries where um, the physical assets are specialized to begin with. So to elaborate just a little bit, the, sec the, the last two points, because the first one I already discussed in detail, um, this chart shows the first bar, the purple bars for each industry is the liquidation recovery rate of physical assets. And then the last bar, which is the easiest one to read, is uh, from our data, there's also liquidation value of intangibles that firms have uh, purchased from outside. And the last bar shows the liquidation rec recovery rate associated with those uh, separable and, and, and intangibles that can be bought from outside, like data, licenses, and trademarks, and so on. And you can notice that the, these two bars, the average value in an industry 
uh, is actually not that much uh, different in many cases. So because there's one fewer reallocation friction that actually helps some of the intangibles to obtain uh, liquidation value. The third uh, um, point is, um, as Nico said, there are two uh, or mo multiple ways of measuring the rise of intangible, but either way you do it, the y-axis is the change in the, rel the prevalence of intangibles relative to intangible plus physical asset, the, uh, the x-axis, is the liquidation recovery rate of physical assets to begin with. And we see uh, across different ways of measurement that the rise of intangible has been more pronounced where the physical assets are more specific and have low liquidation values uh, in the first place. So putting all of that together, uh, we find that the liquidation value that we estimate from, for example, all CompuStat firms um, has not changed substantially over time. They've always been pretty low liquidation value, for example, relative to book asset. Um, and over time, there's a little bit of decrease in contribution from physical assets and a little bit of increase in contribution of the intangibles uh, that are, uh, are on the books. Uh, but by and large, they, the overall uh, total value, total liquidation value has stayed somewhat stable. So what's fundamentally different about intangibles, Nicole told us about the implications for thinking about investment. We also in more recent work found that uh, intangibles seem to be more scalable in a way that asset specificity doesn't uh, affect the firms nearly as much and more intangibility is associated with more concentration. We also find that more intangibility is associated with more longevity of firms. Uh, whereas asset specificity actually does the opposite of firms, they decrease the longevity of firms. So to wrap up, um, we, uh, the, our numbers are obviously also uh, potentially useful for guiding borrowing constraints if you write down borrowing constraints based on firms liquidation values. But in the US, not all firms borrow on the basis of liquidation values. As you can see, for large firms and firms in particular with positive cash flows, liquidation value is not a function uh, so much uh, debt capacity, total borrowing is not so much a function of liquidation value, but for small firms and firms that have negative cash flows, there is a significant and positive reliance on liquidation value for borrowing. And we also explore many more uh, implications for debt contracts in a companion paper. So to wrap up, uh, we uh, spent a lot of time to collect data on the asset specificity of firms across industries to understand the nature of firms assets. And we uh, find that firms' assets are often highly specific. It's not just a stereotype of tech firms, but so much more general. And we've also uh, devoted some effort to uh, understanding the physical foundations of these economic properties, and as well as the implications for several issues in macro finance. And I hope the micro data will be helpful for a variety of analysis for understanding firms and uh, macroeconomic implications. And with that, um, the final paper is by, um, presented by Christina on um, bottlenecks, um, sectoral imbalances, and U.S. productivity slowdown. All right. Um, great. Well, thank you so much um, uh, to the organizers for putting us on the program. As Yaron just said, um, I'm excited to present our uh, some new work entitled Bottlenecks, Sectoral Imbalances and the US Productivity Slowdown. Um, and this is joint work with Daron Asimoglu and David Otter. So, so one of the most salient features of innovation in the last several decades is that there's been a surge in innovations in ICT and electronics or in computers and electronics. So this figure here just shows you a glimpse of that surge. So you can see in the green line, there's been a huge rise in the number of total patents since the 1980s and a high rise in the fraction of those patents coming just from these two sectors. So this suggests to some, we're on the verge of kind of a new age of abundance here or on the verge of a singularity coming from the rise of these kind of super intelligent computers. However, this explosive growth coincides with relatively lackluster overall productivity growth in recent decades. So what I've plotted here um, is TFP growth in both manufacturing in the orange line and in overall um, uh, for the economy in the blue line. 
And you can see that there's been a slowdown kind of in particular um, in the recent two decades. And so this pattern suggested to others that maybe many promising or revolutionary technologies have already been exploited and we're in for kind of a new age of slower growth. So in this paper, we're gonna offer a hypothesis that reconciles uh, these two facts. So our hypothesis is based on the observation um, that I showed you at the beginning that technological advances have been unbalanced across sectors. And in fact, this uneven growth is gonna create endogenous bottlenecks in the economy that hold back aggregate productivity. So we're gonna provide a simple theoretical framework wherein when your advancements um, and your inputs are complementary to each other, then new technologies are gonna require, require simultaneous improvements in several of your inputs. So for example, um, take for example, the automotive industry. You know, we're not gonna have large advances there if we just have advances in sensors or software, but we have to have kind of concurrent advances in the other inputs, so batteries or tires uh, and so on. And so when one of these technologies, say batteries, kind of lags behind the others, you can see that there's rapid growth in some sectors without having aggregate productivity growth. And in the case of the, the car example, which I just, uh, just mentioned, the bottleneck that's created by batteries is endogenous in that it was created by the advancements or kind of the big advancements um, in sensors or software or the other inputs uh, to cars. And so the bulk of the rest of the paper then is gonna be to provide some empirical evidence for the main prediction of this hypothesis. So we're gonna show that after controlling for the mean, greater dispersion in an industry's supplier's TFP growth has a large negative effect on an industry's own TFP growth. So before digging into the paper, I just wanna provide one illustrative case study for a bottleneck that was relieved in recent decades and led to widespread kind of innovation and growth uh, throughout the economy. So one example of this um, would be the invention of GPS. So historically, navigation, uh, both on sea and in the air, was done with sight lines, optical, optical instruments, and kind of detailed tables. And in the 1970s, uh, this was aided a bit by the invention of radio positioning. But really, the game didn't change until GPS was invented. Um, by the military in 1978, um, and then opened up to the civilian population just a couple of years later. So what did GPS do? Well, it provides geo-positioning information um, as well as atomic level timekeeping, but with both of which are kind of critical for recording the precise time and location um, across the globe. And so here we are four decades later, and I think it's you know, obvious that the invention of GPS enabled several innovations that certainly were kind of beyond the imaginations of the military engineers who kind of initially made GPS. So some examples of this might be precision uh, agriculture, um, the synchronization of power and transmission systems or cellular towers, weather predictions and kind of uh, uh, exploration, as well as maybe things that are most familiar to us um, such as ride hailing apps uh, and so on. So with this motivating example in mind then, I'll just jump right into the meat of the paper. So first I'm gonna provide, um, present a motivating theoretical framework, which is gonna link the innovation of an industry to the innovation of its suppliers. I'm then gonna talk briefly about the data sources we're gonna use for the analysis. Um, and then I'll present some empirical results um, that support the importance of these sectoral productivity bottlenecks. Okay, so first the motivating theoretical framework. So our goal here is going to be to derive estimating equations that link an industry's own productivity to the distribution of the productivity of their suppliers. So to that end, we're gonna consider that there are N sectors. They're each gonna produce some output Y using a constant returns to scale production function, where they're gonna be using labor as well as inputs, intermediate inputs X, from a set of supplying industries denoted by this, by this S here. And then they're gonna produce with some productivity A. So the most important feature here is going to be how productivity evolves. And so we're gonna introduce a quality ladder structure where your innovation, your productivity, um, <coughs> increases by some amount lambda with each new innovation. And the critical assumption 
is going to be that the arrival rate of innovation, which we've denoted here by phi, is going to depend on the, how the technological advancements of your inputs. And the shape um, and your inputs here are going to be denoted by the set, the set S. And the shape of this distribution is going to depend on kind of these two functions here, this big H and the, the little h. And so our purpose is the most important feature is going to be the shape of this little h function. So when h is convex, it's going to mean that the most advanced inputs are going to determine your innovation. Or in other words, kind of the inputs are substitutes um, in determining your innovation. But in the, what we're going to argue is the more empirically relevant case, where h is concave, it's going to mean that uh, greater dispersion in innovation among your suppliers is actually going to hinder your innovation. So if you simply take some Taylor expansions of this around the mean, you're going to get an equation here, which I think relatively intuitively create, relates uh, the arrival rate of innovation, so the growth of innovation in a sector, to two terms. The first term here is the cost weighted mean of the productivities of your inputs. And the second is going to be, again, the weighted uh, variance of the productivity of the inputs. And so um, perhaps I mentioned this before, but since we're going to be assuming here that both of these functions are monotonic, we're going to have that the uh, mean effect is always positive. So that's going to capture the fact that when your suppliers do better, when they're innovating more, you get better tires, you get better batteries, that's always going to be kind of good for your innovation. And then the key feature is going to be how in the case where this H function is, conca is concave, you're going to have that this variance enters negatively. So when your inputs are complements to each other, conditional on the average productivity growth of your suppliers, a higher dispersion of productivity growth is going to hold you back. So that was the model equation. It's going to lead us pretty directly to our empirical specifications where what we're going to be doing is relating the growth rate of TFP in an industry I to both the average TFP growth of the suppliers, again, weighted by their share, and the variance of the TFP growth of their suppliers. So in addition to kind of adding some control terms and an error term here, there's going to be two differences from the theoretical equation. The first is that we're going to be using TFP here uh, as our measure of innovation. And then because TFP is not interpretable in levels, we're going to be linking the five-year growth rates of TFP across sectors and not the levels. And our hypothesis here for the, for the bottleneck, uh, for bottlenecks is going to be that this mean coefficient is positive, but that the variance coefficient on the variance uh, is negative. And this is the equation we're going to take with us uh, to the data. So just a little bit on the data sources we're going to be using to explore this. So first, we need to know who your suppliers are. And for that, we're going to be using the detailed uh, benchmark input output tables um, for the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So we're going to have these from 1977 uh, through to 2002. We're going to link these to measures of TFP growth by sector. And so for manufacturing, we're going to be taking this from the NBR CES um, database which is sourced from the annual survey of manufacturers. So this is the, going to be the US census data. And for non-manufacturing, we're going to take it from the BLS multi-productivity uh, uh, statistics. So in manufacturing, we're going to have 462 NAICS industry codes. And we're going to use data there from 1977 through to 2007. Outside manufacturing, we're going to have to be much more aggregated, but we're going to have 42 uh, non-manufacturing industries, and this data will run from 1987 through to 2007. And so while our main focus is going to be on the U.S., we're also going to show some international patterns here. And for that, we're going to use the CLEMS data from that for nine European countries. And there we're going to have data from 1987 uh, to 2007. And then lastly, I'll get to the details of this a little bit more, but we're going to supplement our measures of TFP with direct measures of innovation. So this would be, um, we're going to be using counts of patents across industries, as well as the distribution of patent citations across industries to construct kind of an alternative to this input output structure. So in the interest of time, 
I won't, I won't linger on that too much longer and I'll just kind of jump right in to the empirical results. So most of what I'm gonna show you in the slides today is gonna to focus just on the manufacturing sector. This is where TFP is perhaps best measured. Um, and it's also where we have the most data. I'll show you some robustness in the slides to kind of including other industries. And we have some kind of additional results on that uh, as well. So the first plot here is going to show you that positive relationship between the average TFP growth of your suppliers and the TFP growth of an industry. So on the y axis, I plotted the TFP growth of an industry. And since I want to focus just on the average term in this picture, I've residualized out both year fixed effects and the variance of supplier TFP growth. And then I've done the same thing on the x axis where I've plotted the average supplier TFP growth, again, residualizing out the variance and the year fixed effects. And then I want to note this is a bin scatter plot. So each dot here represents kind of 2% of the data as opposed to a kind of a particular industry year. But you can see here there's a, a positive correlation. So when your inputs get more productive, so do you. And that's going to contrast with the variance of upstream TFP growth. So now on the y-axis, again, I have the TFP growth of an industry. This time I've residualized out the year fixed effects and the average TFP growth. So this is going to be kind of conditional on the average TFP growth of your suppliers. What effect does the variance have? And again, I've plotted against the variance again with the same residualization. And so here you can see that kind of this is supporting the kind of key prediction um, of the bottleneck hypothesis, conditional on the mean, a higher dispersion of productivity growth among your suppliers kind of holds you back. I want to mention here what somewhat obvious point here is that there's one big outlier here. So this is generally industries that heavily use computers uh, as an input. And as we just talked about, the computer and electronics sector uh, had kind of this explosive productivity growth over this period. And so while our results are robust to removing this, uh, to removing computers and electronics or this point in particular, I think it also highlights kind of exactly the mechanism we're talking about. So explosive growth in this kind of this computer and electronics sector doesn't lead to this explosive growth in the industries that use computer and electronics because it has this kind of drag through the variance or since it's kind of leaving the other input sectors behind. So I'll just formalize those pictures in a table here. So on the left three columns, I have the results just for manufacturing as we were just looking at. On the right three columns, I have the results for all industries, so including those non-manufacturing industries. And then in the first column of each of those panels, I just have the kind of simple effect with the average. So this confirms what we saw on average when the TF growth, when your suppliers uh, get more productive, so do you. The second column here is just what we were looking at in the figures. It says that conditional on the average uh, growth of your suppliers, um, a higher dispersion of that productivity growth kind of has a negative predictive effect on the TFP growth of an industry. And then lastly, in the third column here um, for each of these panels, I've replaced the variance with the kind of tails of the distribution. So the bottom decile and the top decile. And here you see a similar sort of pattern. So conditional on the average, you do better when you're the bottom, uh, so your least uh, uh, productive uh, input does better. And then conditional on the average, kind of the with the top doing even better kind of holds you back. So in addition to these estimates being uh, statistically significant, we find that this imbalance of productivity growth across sectors meaningly contributed to the aggregate kind of slowdown in productivity. So in order for that to be true, it would have to be both that there's been a rise in this variance of TFP growth among suppliers and that the coefficients that are in this table that we've estimated for the variance are kind of economically meaningful. And so we find that that's in, in fact the case. So what I've plotted here is just for manufacturing industries, but it's the variance of supplier TFP growth in each period. And you can see here that it more than doubled um, between 1977 and 2007. And so a simple back of the envelope um, suggests um, that this rise in the variance of TFP can actually explain a large fraction of the productivity slowdown. 
So in these orange bars here, I have plotted what our estimates imply aggregate TFP growth would have been if the variance of supplier TFP growth had remained at the same level that it was between 1977 and 1987. And you can see here that this implies that for 1997 to 2007, um, TFP growth, in fact, would have been almost as high as it was um, through the early 80s and would have been more about four percentage points higher uh, than it was in reality. So uh, kind of suggesting that this, this mechanism uh, is meaningful. So in addition, our framework allows us to explore kind of which of the industries are the bottlenecks. So recall that bottlenecks in our setting are endogenous. So that means they're created by explosive growth in other sectors. So we define bottleneck industries as those that have the biggest negative effect on the variance when you increase their TFP growth by 10%. So those are the industries that are at the bottom. If they grew more, the variance of supplier TFP would fall. And then in contrast, we uh, define these outlier industries as the ones that have the biggest positive effect on the variance when they grow by 10%. So they're the things like computers and electronics, when they grow by a lot, they actually increase the variance. And I think kind of intuitively, we see that these outlier industries here are semiconductors, electronics and computers. And we find that these bottleneck industries are things like pharmaceutical prep, turbines, circuits, uh, and circuits. And qualitatively, we find that these outlier industries kind of are, are pretty important. So a simple back of the envelope says that if you redistributed 20 percentage points of TFP growth from just the 10 fastest growing industries, and you gave it to the bottom 50% of industries, so that you kept average TFP the same, but you changed the distribution of TFP, you would get an increase in aggregate TFP of, kind of over one percentage point, which on a base growth rate of something like four to five percentage points is very substantial. So I won't go through all of the details here in the interest of time, but I just want to highlight that these kind of bottleneck patterns are very robust. So what I've plotted here um, is the coefficient on the upstream variance, so the coefficient of interest, for a set of different specifications. And you can see that it's large and negative. Uh, for example, when we include industry-specific trends, when we weight each sector by their share of value added, when we add series of controls, as I mentioned before, and when we drop the computer sector altogether, we fix the input output table, or when we define uh, the, the we, we weight industries not by their intermediate share, but by their share of total costs. And I just want to highlight one kind of particularly important robustness check, which is that since we're regressing TFP of an industry on kind of the contemporaneous TFP growth of their suppliers, we might be concerned that common productivity shocks, both to an industry and their suppliers, uh, could create a mechanical bias. And so isolating productivity changes that kind of emanate from common technological improvements across many developed countries may at least kind of partially assuage this concern. So to that end, we explored a specification where we instrument the mean and, uh, and variance of supplier TFP with the mean and variance of those supplying industries, TFP growth in France, Germany, and the UK. And so what I've plotted here, again, just focusing on the variance term, uh, since that's kind of our, our main coefficient of interest. In the top bar, I've plotted the OLS estimate. And below that, I've plotted the IB estimate. And I'm showing you this both for our baseline spec and a specification where I include industry-specific trends. And you can see that in both cases, the OLS and the IV estimates are very similar to each other and bolstering our confidence that these patterns aren't driven by kind of common shocks to industries as well as their suppliers. So in the theoretical framework, these bottleneck patterns were driven uh, by complementarities and in innovation. But we're using TFP, which is a kind of indirect measure of innovation. So it's kind of natural to ask kind of, are these patterns capturing innovation or could they be driven by kind of relative price effects across, across industries? And we show that it's likely driven by innovation um, in three different ways. So first, we directly control for the mean and variance of supplier prices and employment. So if TFP were mismeasured, then the kind of standard neoclassical effect 
We're in an industry benefits when their suppliers get more productive because they face lower prices. Um, well, that could be part of what's driving our patterns. But we find that actually, even after controlling uh, for these additional variables, it doesn't qualitatively change the relationship between kind of the average and the variance TFP of your suppliers and an industry's TFP growth. Second, we show that these bottlenecks patterns hold when we consider the distribution of TFP, not just among your intermediate input suppliers, but among your idea suppliers, which we measure as the set of industries you cite using your patents. And so the dispersion of TFP growth among these idea suppliers uh, should be less closely linked um, to kind of relative input prices. And yet we find that these bottleneck patterns kind of still show up uh, as uh, statistically and economically meaningful. And then third, we explore these patterns using a more direct measure of innovation uh, in patents. So what I'm showing you here are two bin scatters that are analogous to the ones I showed you at the beginning, but where I've replaced the growth rate of TFP, both for the supplier and the industry, with the growth rate of patenting. And so you can see here that the patterns look equally, if not, if not more stark. So on the left, this is the average. You can see that when the industries that, um, when your supplier industries patent more, you also patent more. But on the right, you can see that there's this negative variance effect. So when there's a higher variance of patenting across your supplier industries, that makes you kind of less likely to patent yourself, conditional on the average. So then last couple minutes, I just want to show you some uh, patterns using the international data. So specifically, we use the world input output table and the CLEMS productivity data. And we do this for nine European countries. And this time we calculate the mean and variance of supplier TFP, not just across supplying industries, but across supplying industries and countries. And so the table below shows what we get. So the first column here just kind of validates again that the average effect that we've uh, been seeing all along, which is on average, when industries and countries that you uh, use as your inputs get more productive, you also get more productive. And then the next three columns show that there's this kind of uh, this bottleneck effect uh, in this data. So conditional on the average TFP growth, when, the, when there's a higher dispersion of that productivity growth, um, it kind of holds you back. And these different columns differ in that they include a kind of more uh, rigorous set of fixed effects. And then they show that this relationship holds, this kind of bottleneck relationship holds, even when we use only kind of cross industry variation, or in fact, we take out the cross industry variation, we use only within industry cross country variation. So I'll wrap it up there and we can get to the Q&A. Um, I'll just leave you with a specific bottleneck proposal that came from the onion from several years ago. Um, suggests that if our bottleneck hypothesis is indeed correct, perhaps when we get these blue cubes of energy, we'll finally be able to unlock kind of aggregate productivity growth. So thanks a lot uh, for uh, sticking around to the end and uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Christina. We have 12 minutes for Q&A. If you have a question, um, you can indicate that by clicking on raise hand or other panelists can also uh, directly ask questions by unmuting yourself. Uh, I had a quick question, Christina, um, that I was wondering if you could help me think about. So one thing that seemed to me like it could potentially explain some of the regression results is if I imagine that uh, there's unobserved quality change uh, that is not picked up in the TFP measures for the supplier, and then in the production functions, I have complementarities, would that also generate a similar pattern in the sense that because the quality change that happens in the upstream industries is not being measured in the TFP of those industries, but it does affect the ability of the downstream guy to produce. And then because there are complementarities across inputs, 
if one of my inputs becomes way better, but the other ones don't, then my measured TFP would increase by less than it otherwise would if I had more uniform growth. Could something like that be driving these, these patterns as well? I just want to get your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start and then, and then maybe uh, kind of Daron or David could jump in. I mean, I think, you know, that was part of what we were thinking about when we talked about the importance of these kind of neoclassical effects, which is a bit of what you're saying. So if TFP, I think you're basically saying if TFP is mismeasured, if we're basically having these unobserved quality differences, then in fact, what we might have been picking up was uh, basically these neoclassical effects wherein you do better because you're your, they got cheaper, or you could think that they got better for a given price, but either way, um, it would be kind of through this, this effect. And so I think that's where, so it, I think that's a legitimate concern with thinking about TFP, almost certainly, we're not going to claim TFP is perfectly measured uh, in this data. But I think that's where kind of both the kind of horse race we did uh, with including prices and kind of quantities of the upstream industries um, is important, but also kind of using the more direct measures of innovation such as patenting growth, uh, which wouldn't, I, you know, we have to, we could talk a little bit more, but I don't think would be kind of subject to the same, to the exactly the same critique. Any other questions? Um, I, I think there is quite a lot of connections across the different papers that were presented. If any of the authors would like to discuss the connections uh, that the audience can draw between your work and the findings in other papers in the session, that will also be very helpful. For example, Nico and Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about the issue of rents? I was actually going to ask David um, in that I was watching his presentation with interest um, because he included um, barriers to entry and product differentiation, which is something that Nico and I have thought about um, in other settings, which would be pretty complex to, to add to our model, but you seem to have a tractable way of doing it. Um, and in your it, it was hard to tell from the presentation how dynamic your um, your model is in terms of the barriers to entry, right? Because the quasi rents would be an, like if you're thinking that the intangible is patents, for example, right? One of the um, criticisms of the the rents data with regard to patents is that it is actually quasi rents for the risk and the the experimentation um, that companies that are investing in R&D take on, and then eventually they get a patent, but they're not actually getting a pure rent, they're getting a quasi rent. Um, so could your model capture um, in a tractable way that kind of dynamic? Because um, that seems like if, if we're gonna think about rents in a serious way, we wanna, would wanna include that for that. We, wanna, we would wanna allow for that possibility in the model. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so at some apps, I mean, I, I think I've talked like a long time <laughs> about this and I'm not sure if it would answer the, the thing that you're wondering about, but I'll have a go. Um, so at some super abstract level, the, the framework that we use is, 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 is sort of a bit Walrasian. So, you know, at some abstract level, you could say, okay, I'm just going to index everything by state of nature. I'm going to index everything by time period. And then these formulas that I showed you, they would still be valid uh, in like an arrow de Bruce sense now, instead of the, the, way that I, the way that I was using them. So at that level, yes, it's, it's very much possible. I mean, in practice though, like taking this stuff to the data and like populating these sufficient statistics, I think is going to be challenging and it's something that's not so straightforward. So in the, in the paper, when it came to the applied like quantitative exercise, we sort of took a static model that had a free entry condition basically that said that, that there are ways, you know, sort of like using the typical like Mellet steady state thing, you can interpret these, uh, these models with uh, free entry in steady state as if they're like a, a, a dynamic kind of model, even though they're sort of static. 
And there we, we did think about these entry uh, barriers a little bit actually quantitatively as well. And so we imagined you know, that uh, there's some wedge between uh, the, the, um, the amount of money that goes to the proprietors from the profits that are generated relative to the fixed costs. So like your baseline would be if there's free entry, the fixed cost exactly offset whatever uh, profits you're able to achieve over and above you know, your variable costs. But you might think that's not true because of something that's going on in the equilibrium. So for example, maybe the firms are colluding and they're playing a strategy that keeps out the new guys or makes it more expensive for the new guys to come in or something like this. So then you would say, okay, no, the, the amount of money that actually goes to the entrant is some fraction, let's say, of the profits that are earned by the firm. Uh, and then in that case, what's kind of interesting is actually, it's not obvious what is socially optimal because in general, you might have too much entry or too little entry. So the fact that profits don't exactly offset fixed costs doesn't tell you anything about whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Because in some sense, you have to have some idea about what is the value of these new products. And it's sort of, it's a race basically between the, the, the markup that you could charge and then the area under the demand curve when you enter. And, and, the, and those two things are like completely unrelated conceptually. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, if you just take a CES model and you, you plug in some numbers, it's not the case that actually you want there to be free entry in the sense that it's socially optimal to say that profit should exactly offset, be offset by the fixed cost of entry. Uh, hopefully that goes some way towards answering the question. Thanks. It's useful. Thank you. Um, any other questions? If not, in the last few minutes, I want to ask another question to connect the different papers. Uh, I have read uh, about the impact of intangibles, which is a topic that connects several of the papers here on TFP measurement, but I'm sure Nico and Jen and Christina and David and Daron would know uh, this issue much more. So do you mind sharing some of your thoughts on how to think about uh, the way intangibles affect the way we measure TFP and think about TFP, uh, even at the more conceptual level. Um, I I can jump in here uh, if you want. Uh, so we so I, I I don't know if you bring this up indirectly, Yaron, but Jan and I just uh, uh, finished a paper on this that's on both our website. Um, it's a very sort of again very conceptually simple paper, but what we're trying to get at is. Um, the possibility that some of the stuff that's classified as intermediate um, purchases in IO tables actually represents uh, intangible investment and should be reclassified as, as investment. Um, and so, you know, what, when you do that, you change the way that the capital stock should be measured. And so you change potentially measures of CFP uh, or at least, you know, solo residuals. And so we sort of go through that exercise. So the type of intangibles that we're thinking about are very much um, related to organization capital. So, you know, like a prime example would be consultant services. There is a if you played around with the IO ta tables, you know that the professional and technical services category is huge and growing. Um, and so what we're the mind experiment we're playing with is what if this is actually investment and not uh, um, and not intermediate uh, purchases or purchases yeah, of intermediate goods by firms. Um, so I mean the bottom line is for for this to bias TFP measure TFP growth downward, which is what we hope is going on. Uh, the relative price of these in these capital goods has to be rising faster than other capital goods, and it turns out that's the case in in the data. So you can get some some um, traction, some some quantitative traction from that that simple idea. The thing we we highlight in the paper is if you add markups on top of that, you actually go further uh, quantitatively. Uh, markups in and of their own, so like David knows this very well, for instance, uh, can bias downward TFP growth, and there's kind of a, a combined effect of TFP plus and or sorry, markups plus intangibles that gets you even further. So I think, I mean, it depends a bit how we do the calculations, but you can get something like 40 to 50 percent higher TFP growth after 2000 when you do this sort of reclassification. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, it's obviously. It's a hypothetical exercise. We don't we don't quite know whether these uh, these things in the IO tables actually represent capital goods or not, or capital investment or not. 
but it's, it's certainly a, a possibility. And this is quite different from, this is not at all about misallocation, uh, like uh, Christina and her co-authors were highlighting. This is really just about uh, standard old school sort of residual speed bias, but it's a possibility we can, that it's worth taking seriously. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. And I know that our time is almost up. Thank you so much to all the presenters and to everyone who attended the session. I, I learned a lot from the session and I hope you got something useful out of it as well. And um, happy new year and hope everything is going well for everyone across the world. Thanks, Yaron. Happy new year, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, and thanks a lot, Larry, for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.